This week on Africa Weekly, we take you to Kenya, where a US NGO has been trialing a campaign that offers villagers a cash income to help alleviate poverty. And we meet 78-year-old Hatifari Munongi, the oldest Zimbabwean to earn a university degree, who has built a replica traditional homestead at her home in Harare. But first, a summary of the stories that made the headlines this week. A concert was held on Sunday in South Africa in the climax of a year of events celebrating the centennial of Nelson Mandela's birth in 1918. The tribute concert, featuring Beyonce and an all-star lineup including Ed Sheeran, Jay-Z and Usher, was part of a campaign to tackle poverty, child malnutrition and boost gender equality. Leaders of the G5 Sahel Group gathered for a conference in Nouakchott on Thursday with the general consensus that significant progress has been made since the launch of the bloc in July 2017. Despite the enormous difficulties, especially logistically, with the not insignificant counterblows experienced in this phase of our nascent organization, we have made significant progress in terms of common security. The five Sahel states, Mauritania, Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali and Niger, have been struggling against extremism and lawlessness along the Sahara's southern rim. Campaigning for the closely watched second round of the presidential vote in Madagascar began on Tuesday, promising to be a fierce fight as the bitter rivals make their final pitches to the electorate of nearly 10 million. Presidential hopeful Mark Ravula Manana said he was confident of closing the gap for a second round victory over his rival, who narrowly beat him in the first leg of presidential polls. Andri Rojoelina got 39% of votes and Ravula Manana 35% in last month's poll, setting up the pair for a close contest in the December 19th runoff. A Rwandan court found dissident politician Diane Rigara not guilty of forgery and inciting insurrection, charges that saw her imprisoned for over a year and highlighted a crackdown on opposition in the country. A panel of three judges dropped all the charges against her, her mother Adeline and four co-accused. I didn't know what to expect, so I'm surprised, pleasantly surprised. 37-year-old Rigara was arrested in September last year after her attempt to run in Rwanda's July presidential election was denied on the grounds that she had allegedly forged signatures of supporters for her bid. The court cleared her of these charges and those related to her criticism of the government through press conferences. A call by Togolese opposition parties for an economic shutdown, or Dead Togo Day, to protest upcoming parliamentary elections failed to muster support on Tuesday, with many businesses staying open as usual. The West African nation's main opposition has vowed to boycott elections this month over alleged fraud and had called on workers to stay at home on Tuesday at the start of campaigning. But in the main markets of some of the capital's districts, most shops, banks and public administration offices were open with plenty of activity during the morning. The opposition has called for President Forg Nasingbe to step down after more than a decade in power and for constitutional reform to limit presidential mandates. A coalition of 14 opposition parties also objects to the composition of Togo's independent National Election Commission and wants it revamped. Egypt's first ever Defence Expo Arms Fair was inaugurated in Cairo on Monday, with hundreds of companies exhibiting. Forty countries were represented at the three-day event in Egypt, one of the Middle East's top military powers. Among the items on display were US armoured personnel carriers, Indian and Saudi assault rifles and gold-plated firearms from Pakistan. International human rights organizations have long accused Egypt of using weapons made in Europe against civilians to suppress opposition and activists, accusations Cairo has systemically denied. Monica earns a living rearing chickens in this village in western Kenya. 
She developed the business with her husband, thanks to a project by a US NGO offering villages a free cash income. Every month for two years, she receives about 20 euros, a sum that has changed her life. This money will take me out of poverty because after having fulfilled all my dreams, I can then invest my savings in my business and grow it, and I'll have a better life. Rethinking humanitarian aid by giving out cash directly is seen as the best way to fight poverty in Africa, according to Give Directly. Since October 2016, the NGO has been studying the effectiveness of universal income. When you give people cash, the first thing you give them is choice. Pretty much, we are telling you, like, here are the resources. Make the decision on how you want to use it. So you're giving people a choice, which traditional aid doesn't do. About 20,000 people are taking part in this universal income campaign, which they say is the largest ever such study. Beneficiaries are divided into several groups, with some receiving money for two years, while others receive the same amount for 12 years. Despite fears that the money may not be put to good use, villagers insist the cash will not be squandered. How would you buy uh, something with the 2,000 shillings, which is only enough to feed you? How can you buy useless things? That money is for you to earn a living and not to buy useless things. According to the World Bank, over a third of Kenyans live below the international poverty line of $1.90 a day. With the trial still in its early stages, these villagers are hoping to reap the benefits, lifting them permanently above it. Hati Farim Nongi is something of a legend in Harare. Having grown up at a time when women's education was not a priority, she decided to go back to school after retiring. And two years ago, she graduated with a degree in sociology, gender and development, aged 78, becoming the oldest Zimbabwean woman to earn a degree. It was a great day, and I, I, I couldn't believe myself. One, that I had got a degree which I had always wanted to have. You know, my husband was a graduate and I always wanted to be a graduate as well. Uh, so it was like a, a great achievement. Gogo or Grandmother Mnongi used to be a school teacher and today she writes poetry and stories. Since graduating, she has also built a replica traditional homestead in suburban Harare to help preserve the country's rich cultural heritage. There's so many aspects of traditional life that are taught at this village which can benefit visitors in their upbringing and daily lives. Completed in 2017, the site features a round hut, cattle pen and rabbit run, all of which delight visiting school groups. I would like to urge all young children to visit the village because there is a lot to learn. They will have an opportunity to eat roasted maize, they will play traditional games like Nodo, they will listen to folk stories told by a grandmother. Gogo Mnongi hopes her achievements will educate and inspire younger generations. Women should try to, to dream big. Women should not let men dream for them. Women should dream for themselves. Hundreds of children have already visited Gogom Nongi's project and she hopes it will become a cornerstone of every Harare pupil's education. Dakar's Museum of Black Civilizations was launched on Thursday, the culmination of a 50-year-old project to celebrate the achievements of black civilizations from the beginnings of humanity up to the present day. Senegalese President Macky Sall, who attended the opening ceremony, said the museum was part of a long-term project promoting cultural integration. The Museum of Civilization Noir rejoins, in effect, a dynamic the Museum of Black Civilizations is indeed part of a long-term project. 
It is a project of harmony, drawing together African and Afro descendants, united in the affirmation of their cultural values and civilization. And runners raced through the streets of Libreville on Sunday in the sixth edition of the Gabon Marathon, which was won by Shedra Kimayo from Kenya. That's all from us at Africa Weekly. Until next week. <laughs>